stress one more time that he would be the one who speaks at this point in the service. So please do join me in prayer one last time. Father, we thank you so much that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us in your word and through your son. Father, we ask that during this time in which we've come to hear you speak to us, that we would honestly be ready to listen, that we would be ready to listen in light of the joys and the struggles this past week has, has put upon us. Lord, that we would be ready to listen amidst our struggles with sin, with sin amidst our struggles with shame. Lord, that we would see and savor and then depend on and walk with the Jesus who died for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit, that I would say, think, and do only what would make most of Jesus. And I pray that your spirit would take the truths of your word and impress them and penetrate them so deep into our hearts that we well up in affection for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We ask all of this to be done in your, in your power and for your glory. Amen. How many of you have ever been on a really successful team? Really successful team. Maybe it's a team at work. Maybe it was like the adult softball team that won championship after championship. Maybe it was back in the day, long time ago. High school football, high school basketball. And if that's the case for you, well, good for you. <laughs> I obviously didn't have that opportunity. <laughs> but you and I both know that good teams, whether you've been on them or even cheered from like LaRusse's Cardinals or Jordan's Bulls, Good teams are not just collection of talented individuals. They're like humble, united family. Humble, united family. And that's exactly the point that Paul is reminding us of in Ephesians chapter 4. He's saying the church is more than a a collection of very good-looking and multi-talented individuals, which in fact you are. But more than that, The church is meant to be a humble, united family sharing one purpose, sharing one mission, constantly looking to the Savior who died to make them family. And so this morning, we jump back into Ephesians chapter 4, a letter that we began a few months ago, and we've already unpacked chapters 1 to 3, slowly slowly and carefully considering all that Christ has done for us. See, this letter was written in the first century, to the church near Ephesus, and yet it is pregnant with timeless and relevant truth for us today. And we're reminded of that as we remember what Paul first told us in the front nine of this letter, chapters one to three. In those chapters, Paul essentially took us on a theological flight. It's like you get in one of those tiny little airplanes at Marion Airport, and a few moments later, you're 9,000 feet up looking for the parachute because you can see everything. You can see it all. You get a breathtaking view. That's what Paul has done in chapters 1 to 3. He's taken us on a flight into the clouds of wondrous theology, reminding us of all that God has done for us. Chosen before the foundation of the world. Redeemed by his blood. Assured by his spirit. Given new life as Christ gave his life for you. And not just given new life, but put into a new society. The church. The body of Christ. As chapter chapter 3 verse 10 says... Our, collectively, the church, we get to display the manifold wisdom of God. We get to live for something much greater than ourselves. Oh, what a wondrous flight that is. Chapters 1 to 3. And so this morning we jump back into chapter 4. The, the, essentially what Paul does is he lands the theological flight on the runway of our daily lives. He brings all the 30,000 foot, or 8,000 foot if you're taking the flight from Marion, 8,000 foot theology, down to the, what do I do now? What do I do now in light of all that God has done for me? And he slowly and carefully walks us through, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 16, which we're going to unpack over the next three weeks, he says, I want you to be a healthy church. In light of all that God has done for you, I'm not going to address individuals first and foremost. I'm addressing the church. This wonderful good news about the Jesus who died to save the church must first be understood and applied by the church. And so today we consider the big idea, which Paul has for us, is walk together. Essentially, church, walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. 
Walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk is what his big idea is for today. Next week, we're going to hear him say, serve together. And in two weeks, we're going to hear him say, grow up into Christ together. Paul wants us to be a healthy church, a unified family, not collection of individuals, a healthy church that first, in verse 1 to 6, walks or lives out this calling together. And he's going to help us answer three questions. Three questions that I had after I read the text is, what does it mean to walk the walk? How do we do that? And then why should I? Why should I? So keep the Bibles open. We begin in verse 1. What does it mean to walk the walk in Christ in light of what he's done for us? Listen to verse 1. This is Paul speaking to the church near Ephesus. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, urge you, not just encourage, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Essentially, he wants our external conduct to match our internal calling. External, internal matching. Kind of like wearing matching outfits. I don't know if you remember, last Sunday, among the many things we celebrated, first and foremost, the resurrection of Jesus, not too far down the list of things to celebrate on Easter Sunday was the fact that many of us had matching outfits as families. I saw a few families gathered who had their kids all dressed up in cute outfits. I didn't even know Jen was going to do that. I wore a blue shirt that day, and she shows up, and all the kids have blue on. And so does she. I was like, how would you do that? Anyways, we got a photo. Because it's so cute to be matching, and it's beautiful when families do. And as summer approaches, we're going to see another opportunity for families to wear matching outfits. It's family reunion time. For many of us, family reunion time. I don't know if those are big here in in, uh, Carterville, but in Philadelphia, they were in the summer. Every time I drove around near the city parks in Philadelphia, you would see a family reunion. And I knew it was a family reunion because they all had the family reunion T-shirts on. You know what I'm talking about. Love them or hate them. The I Survived Smith Family Reunion 2019 or the If You Knew My Family, You'd Get It. The cheesy joke, the font, the Patriarch's picture, the whole nine yards. But it got my attention every time because their external adornment signified and it matched their inner bond. The Apostle Paul, when he tells us to walk the walk, he's essentially telling us to live a life that externally matches the internal bond that we share in and with Christ Jesus, essentially saying, put on the family reunion t-shirt. And he's not talking cookouts and cotton. He's talking a calling that lives out in your, in your, in your conduct, conduct based on your calling, a life worthy, a walk worthy of the call to which you've been called. And notice here, it's not just an encouragement. It's not just a suggestion, like if you have time in the week this week, Maybe try to walk the walk. Verse 1, I urge you, I urge you, prioritize it, pursue it. He's saying, please, church, please, 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 church, walk the walk. Don't settle for talking the talk. And remember, Paul is speaking to us as someone with skin in the game. How does he describe himself? A prisoner for the Lord. Not metaphorically, literally, a prisoner for the Lord. Under Roman house arrest in the year 62 AD, he knows this is costly. He knows it's hard, so he urges us to walk worthy of the calling we've been given. And this calling worthy of the call, uh, the, this walk worthy of the call is indeed a gift. It's indeed a gift because none of us have walked worthy on our own. It's a gift because the calling God's given us was the effectual call, his sovereign grace intervening into our lives, inviting us to receive the salvation we so desperately need based upon the work of someone, someone else, Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through faith alone and Christ alone, all by God's grace alone. And it's a gift because naturally and by choice, you and I, every single one of us, would walk straight away from God straight apart from him, opposed to him. See, the Bible says that all have sinned. All have sinned. Not just the person to your left and your right, (laughs) but the person in the mirror, the person I look in the mirror at every day. All 
have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've walked in the wrong ways, after the wrong things. It's as if we are blind hikers who are in pursuit of the ocean, and we smell that salt water off in the distance, but because we're blind, we don't know that we're on top of bluff. We're walking towards a cliff, and the closer we get to that, that desired and longed for joy, the closer we get to stepping right off the spiritual cliff, so to say. See, we've walked in all the wrong ways after all the wrong things. We've made God's gifts, the desires of our hearts, and pursued those blindly trying to find God-like joy in them. Ephesians 2 describes what our walk used to be like. Remember what Paul said back then? The bad news that makes the good news good? You were dead. You were dead in the sins and the trespasses in which you once walked. That used to be the pattern of our lives. Walking after self-glory instead of God's glory. Considering our desires over his commands. The idols of our heart slowly buying up all the downtown property of affection in our hearts and pushing Jesus to the peripheral suburbs. We're walking towards the cliff. Unless God takes the blinders off. Unless God redirects us, re- re- changes us, forgives, forgives us. And that's exactly what he does in Christ Jesus. See, it's Jesus who comes down out of eternity. He walks down from eternal comfort. And then he walks up to Calvary where he bled for us. And then he walked out of the tomb alive, defeating death. He lived perfectly the life that you and I should have lived but failed to. He died sacrificially the death, the only holy death that could atone for our sins. And he walked out of the tomb alive. He defeats death. Life, death, resurrection. It's he for me at the cross. The only means through which we can ever walk with God is through faith in the one who came down to walk for us. Jesus Christ has given us what we don't deserve. He takes our curses, gives his blessings, and it's all through faith. This is the effectual calling. And if it's, o- it's only in the celebration of this calling that you'll ever be motivated to walk a life worthy of that, right? See, we might try to walk a good life, but come Tuesday, we're tired. <laughs> that adrenaline, that I'll do it, I'll pull myself up by my bootstraps and be a good person this week, that wears off. The only thing that motivates is the gospel. The only thing that motivates is the Christ who got up from the tomb. The only thing that compels joy and obedience is remembering he walked for me. And now I walk through him. But first and foremost, have you received him? Have you received a calling? It's a walk based on a calling. The calling comes as you respond by faith. You give God your sin. Receive his forgiveness. The only way that you can walk with God is through faith in the one who's walked for you. If you've yet to give him your sin, receive his forgiveness, don't take another step, literally or figuratively, until you do. This is the gift which he's come to offer us. And if you have, well, then I encourage you, walk the walk. And Paul's going to tell us in verse 2 to 3, how do we do that? How do we do this as a church? Well, the bar's high. The bar is as high as Christian character, because that's exactly how we do this. We follow Christ, and we seek to live like Christ. Listen with me to the humbling words of verse 2 and 3. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. How? With all humility and gentleness. All. There's no asterisk there in the scriptures, nor is there in our sermon. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Wow. Wow. This is not a stroll around Cannon Park. This is a hike up Mount Everest. This is hard. The only hope that you and I have for walking this Christian character, this Christian conduct, is by looking to the one who walked it perfectly. We can't do this. I can't do this. You can't do this. But Christ has done this. And by his spirit living in us, he invites us to walk with him. Remember how he walked with all humility. First, Paul says, walk with all humility. Essentially just means your entitlement 
dies to the desire to encourage others. Your selfishness dies to selflessness in the church. It's literally a word that means lowliness of mind. Not only doing what's in the best interest of others, but constantly thinking about them. Constantly wondering, how can I serve them? How can I pray for them? What are their needs? How can I meet them? Remember, this is exactly what Christ has done for us. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, Paul commends us. He says, do nothing, 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 nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Have this mind or these thoughts constantly in you that, that is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus didn't have to consider your interests first. He didn't have to think of you first, but he did. And our only hope in life and death is that he did think of us and then he did act for us as a servant in perfect humility. When I say walk with all humility, you're thinking that sounds like total absurdity. And it is. Until we remember that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. And that's exactly what he calls us to do. So the question for you is, where is it hardest to walk with all humility towards others in the church? Is there anyone in this church you're like, I'm better than? Not not, not a chance would I think of them before myself. Not a chance would I go over and do something to help them before taking care of myself. Where is it hardest for you to be humble? And what might change this week and, Lord willing, moving forward in our church if we were were to be people who regularly meditated on, memorized, went to Philippians chapters 2, verse 3 to 8, in order to depend on the Jesus who walked with all humility towards us first. All humility up to the point of Calvary gave his blood for us. What might change? and your meaningful interactions with others in this church this week. With all humility first. Next, and gentleness. (laughs) More convicting. (laughs) With all humility and gentleness. Gentleness. What comes to mind is kind instead of rough. Compassionate instead of forceful. Humility thinks little of our personal merit. Gentleness thinks little of our personal rights. Just ready to look to the interests of others. And remember, it was Jesus who was first and foremost most gentle towards us. That's exactly how he describes himself in Matthew chapter 11 to those who are tired and needing a gentle Savior. He says, There come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? For I am gentle. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And I will give you rest for your souls. I don't know what you brought in this morning, but I bet it wasn't all smiles and and puppies and flowers and rainbows. I bet a lot of us brought in sorrows. I bet a lot of us brought in struggles. I bet a lot of us brought in struggles with sin and shame and suffering of this world. And on our own accord, the weight of sin would be way too much for me and you. The weight of suffering would be exhausting. The only hope that I have, the only hope that I can offer you is the one who is gentle and lowly in heart and gives us rest for our souls. That one is Jesus Christ. And so here's the question for us. Because Jesus has been gentle towards us, how can we be gentle toward others? Jesus spoke very gentle words at very regular frequency to invite us to run to him. And as I was thinking about that and praying for our church, what came to mind is that the words we use or don't use could be one of the best ways to demonstrate gentleness towards others in this church. Here's what I mean. Are the words that you speak or don't speak, are they gentle words? On the positive side of the coin, when you know of someone in suffering or sickness or or shame and sin, are you quick to pursue them, 
to ask them how they're doing. Hey, how can I pray for you? Can I bring you a meal this week? Can I just come over or sit and talk with you this week? Gentle questioning in pursuit of their good. And on the flip side of that, we consider what we could do. What about the words we put away in pursuit of gentleness? What about the gossip? What about the rumors? What about the speaking poorly about others just because you don't like something about them? How might we be able to be a gentle church with both positive words and putting away negative words? Jesus has been gentle and lowly in heart for our good. I encourage you. I urge you. Be gentle with your words, positively and negatively. And then with patience. Wow. (laughs) This is a marathon, not a sprint. Everest, not Cannon Park. With patience. The applications are meant to be carried out Monday through Saturday of this week and every week thereafter. With patience, bearing with one another in love. That means we are going to be slow to rebuke, quick to build up, initiating reconciliation even when you or I have been sinned against. Ready to to bear the heavier load of the injustice done against us because we look to the cross and we realize our total record of sin has been nailed to the cross. The the nails that went through Jesus' wrists and his ankles, that paid my debt. Who am I to withhold forgiveness from anyone that Christ died to forgive? And so for you. Patiently bearing with one another in love Because God in his steadfast patience has borne with you in your sin all the way to death and giving his son on a cross. Remember how slow and perfectly patient God is? He reminds us of this in Psalm 103 verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. How good is it that he is perfectly patient and perfectly loving? Have you stopped to consider this dual reality about our God? Perfectly patient, perfectly loving, patiently forbearing with us in our sin, in our struggles, in our wanderings towards those those cliffs by the sea. And yet graciously pulling us back, mercifully taking the sin that we deserve to pay for, placing it upon his, his son who bore our sin in his body on the tree that we might die to sin. And then offering us the blessing we don't deserve. How does this encourage you to be patient and forbearing in love with others in the church this week? Is there someone in the church that you're like, oh my gosh. I can't be patient with that person. I can't even be in the room with that person. We laugh and we look around, but it's sadly true. We all struggle with that. We're all sinners saved by grace, being changed by grace. And yet Jesus has come to us, bearing our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin. Die to it, die to it, die, put it to death. And patiently forbear with one another in love. This is so hard. This is so hard, and here's why. I know that you and I, we live in the Instapot, not the Crock-Pot generation. We want our food, and we want it now. And if you don't meet my needs, I'm leaving you. Furthermore, we live in the litigious, not the gracious society. You say something I don't like, I'll sue you instead of forgive you. Patience, forbearing with one another in love, means we are going to be slow. We're going to initiate reconciliation even when we've been wronged. We're going to remember that Christ died to forgive us and then seek to forgive others. How can you be patient and bear with one another in love even this week? And Paul puts all of this under the heading of verse 3. Be eager. Eager. Just like he urged us to walk worthy. Now he says eagerly do something. What is he saying? Be eager to maintain. You're not creating anything. You're maintaining something given by God eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What are you eager to see in the church? Eagerness. 
What do you most desire? What do you most long to see? Is it shorter sermons? Well, get in line. (laughs) And I promise you, next week's probably will be. (laughs) Is it a different kind of music? Is it different kinds of foods? Is it more people, different kinds of people? What are you eager to see in the church? And what if together, instead of all those preferences, we were eager to prioritize the things that God says? In verse 3, he says, be eager to maintain unity. Eager to maintain unity. What if that was the thing you walked into this room on Sundays, Wednesdays, throughout the week, that you were most eager to do? To maintain the unity that the Spirit creates. That Christ, remember in Ephesians 2, here's the only hope for for unity. We once were far off, separated, alienated from God and each other. But Christ abolished the, the, the dividing wall of hostility between us and him. He himself is our peace. He died to make unity possible. Who are we to get in the way of unity? Who are we to do anything that would get in the way of the unity Christ died to make? Church, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Be eager to put on that family reunion t-shirt that, that is befitting of the new life that we have in Christ. See, I encourage us in these ways, but I encourage us first and foremost to remember that Christ died to take off our family reunion t-shirt of the first Adam. Remember the first family reunion we had back in the garden? Genesis chapter 3? Essentially through Adam, we have inherited the raggedy old sin-stained t-shirts that say condemned, not holy, separated, We've, we've desired and longed after things other than God. That t-shirt would not be fit, be fit to be in the presence of the God who is holy. But God gives his son, who lives, dies, and was raised on our behalf. And when we believe in him, we're not just forgiven of our sin. We're given a new t-shirt, so to say. We're imputed with Christ's righteousness, the holy tuxedo of of a perfect track record before God. He accepts us because of he looks at us as if he's looking at his son. And we're given this holy tuxedo of righteousness, the only outfit that is befitting of the eternal Revelation 19 banquet. The the family reunion that goes on and on and on. The one in which you and I will be a part of through faith in Christ Jesus. We are family in him. Don't put on that. The first Adam's t-shirt, put on, wear the holy tuxedo of Christ's righteousness. And I tell you to do that, not by your strength, but by looking to the Christ who died to forgive you and then lives in you. See, Paul tells us this is impossible. Any Christian character is impossible without Christ. He says the more that we actually look to Jesus, the more we look like Jesus. That we all with unveiled face as we behold the glory of God, we're being transformed. Transformed. Changed. Yesterday. I'm more like Christ than I was yesterday. Same with you. As we look to Christ, transformed from one degree of glory to another, we will increasingly be humble. We will increasingly be gentle. We will increasingly be patient, bearing with one another in love, even when yesterday that situation felt impossible. And we we do it all because of his grace alive in us. That's our only hope. Church, walk the walk. Walk it in all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager, eager, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and do so because in Christ Jesus we share one hope. In Christ Jesus, we share one Christian confession that fuels our Christian character. And that's where Paul concludes in verse 4 to 6, our shared Christian confession, our one hope. Listen with me now to verse 4 to 6, the why. Why do we walk the walk? Here's why. Because there is only one body and one spirit. Just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Well, if he was talking about unity, it'd be impossible to miss it. (laughs) He uses the word one, O-N-E, on seven separate occasions in three verses. He's talking about perfect oneness, perfect unity. And what's the picture of perfect unity? Our triune God. Three persons in one essence. 
He's unpacking the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and he relates it to the church. In essence, here's what he's saying. He's saying the unity of the church is meant to be as indestructible as the triune God. Unity in the church is meant to be as indestructible as the triune God. We have one God, and therefore there is one church. We are diverse, but not divided. We are diverse, not divided. There are not multiple churches in this building. Hear me loud and clear. There are not multiple churches in this building. There is one God. There is one church. There is a global big C church, and here at Christian Covenant Fellowship, there is one little C Christian Covenant Fellowship church congregation that covenants together as a family in Christ. One church sharing one hope, and that one hope is stemming from the one triune God that Paul unpacks here. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit. The reason that there's only one church is because the one Holy Spirit animates that church. The one Holy Spirit is the one who enlivens us each individually to salvation, but draws us communally into the new society, the society that displays God's manifold wisdom in the world. One body. No matter how different we look, no matter what different functions we have, just like the thumb and the toe look and and carry out totally different functions, members of one body. Young, old. Rich, poor. Black, white. Democrat, Republican. One body. One body. One Lord, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The reason that there's one church is because there's one Jesus. One Lord. Lord literally means Savior. Our only hope in life and death is that Jesus lived perfectly, died sacrificially, and rose victoriously. That's it. He's it. That's why we gather. Because he got up from the tomb 2,000 years ago. The only reason that a diverse group of people like you and I would get together 2,000 years later on the other side of the world is because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. If we have one hope in one faith and one baptism, it's because it's in one Lord, one Jesus Christ. That is who this church will always be built on. And so the one baptism that we have is through the spirit of conversion. And the external water baptism is the demonstration, the declaration to the world of the inner change that Christ has already brought about in us. One spirit, one Lord, now one father. Verse 6. One God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. God the Father, the creator, the ruler, the sustainer, and the Father. See, through faith in Christ Jesus, we have become orphaned, sinful rebels, now adopted as beloved children. That's who you are in Christ. If you are in Christ Jesus, that's who you are. You used to be an orphan rebel to God. But because Christ left his eternal home, To live, die, and be raised on your behalf, he invites you into God's home. That means that everyone in this church, if you are in Christ, you are family. No matter how different we look, no matter your age, no matter the color of your skin, your income, we are brothers and sisters, not just on paper, but brothers and sisters because blood was shed at Calvary. The blood that's thicker than the blood of biology is the blood that Jesus poured out to buy his church with. No matter how different we are, siblings and families can be night and day different. And I know this to be true. I look at my family, but I also think about my wife's family. She's visiting her sister this weekend, and her sister is night and day different from her. Her sister's favorite hobby, horseback riding. Favorite restaurant, anything with four stars and three dollar figures. She stays up real late, connoisseur of nice things. And we love her. Beck is wonderful. I doubt she'll ever listen to this. So it's all right. (laughs) Jen, on the other hand, (laughs) allergic to everything. Four legs, it doesn't matter. She's allergic to it. She'd She'd eat takeout every night of the week if she could. And she gets up before the sun gets up. They are so different. But they share one father. You know what 
may, you know what that, that conjures up in them? They can't wait to see each other. Jen was so excited to get on that tiny plane from Marion to St. Louis and St. Louis to BWI earlier this week because she was going to get to go see her sister. Shouldn't that be the case in our church when we gather on Sundays and Wednesdays and throughout the week, regardless of who's there? We should be thankful. My brother and sister in Christ, the one who I will share that family reunion for eternity with, I get to share today with. I'm excited. I get to be with you all. What a gift. I'm going to know you for eternity. Why shouldn't today be joyous as part of that journey together? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Reminding us that our practical unity, if we have any hope for practical unity in the church, it requires a deep shared theological unity. This unity stems up real fast when there's not theological unity. When we don't agree on the same Christian confession, when we're not anchored in the same doctrinal truths, well, we're not going to be tied together as family. And so my encouragement for us is live as family. Live as family, no matter how different we are. Larry and Randy, you're family in Christ. Barb and Marilyn, you're family in Christ. Darren and Jameson, family in Christ. No matter how different we are, brothers and sisters, if we are in Christ Jesus. This all sounds great. Idyllic. Utopian. Let's get to work. Before you run out of here and get to work, let me remind you, the only fuel that will sustain this hike up Mount Everest instead of the stroll around Cannon Park is the gospel. If we want a gospel-centered and gospel-unified church, we must be people who steep ourselves in, savor, enjoy, and walk with the Savior, Jesus Christ, who's at the center of the gospel. You see, our only hope for unity is in the fact that he did indeed get up from the tomb. When he walked out of that tomb, he said death is defeated, and that means for us, everything is possible. Everything is possible. When you sense disunity, when you'd rather default to disunity, the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus now lives in you, And he is giving life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. If the spirit of Jesus is alive in you, he's making you like him. If the spirit of Jesus is working in this church, he's making us like him. That means any evidence of unity is an evidence of God's grace. We can celebrate that we have everything from baby carriers to canes in this room. And everything in between. And we long for God to make us more more diverse and yet deeply unified all at once. We have hope for that because Jesus defeated death. He is alive. He is building this church, and he wants it to reflect his triune nature, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's what this church exists to reflect, our one hope. Church, would you walk the walk with me? Would you walk the walk, not just talk the talk? And I say that as someone who knows that walking the walk is hard. It's easy to talk the talk. I've fallen short of these in so many ways. And yet I'm so thankful that Jesus never did fail. And so we look to him now. And what we're going to do in response to the Jesus that we have just heard about in this scripture is we're going to sing praises to him. But I'm also going to invite you to pray specifically for and with others in this church. And here's what it's going to look like. I'm going to invite you to consider a few specific prayer prompts. And I think it would be as meaningful as ever, to gather with those who are sitting near you in small groups, whether or not you know their names, it's all right to ask. Gather with those sitting near you in small groups and just consider the ways that we might pray for our church to be increasingly unified. And on the screen behind me, you'll see some of those prompts. First and foremost, let's individually and corporately confess we haven't always been eager to maintain the unity that Christ died to purchase. We have each... Jameson included, fallen short of humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Let's confess that as sin. And then thank God that he gave his son to die for that, to pay that penalty. And then ask him by his spirit to help us be a unified church. I invite this time to be worshipful to God and slow and prayerful with one another. And if you are still eager to see shorter sermons, well, I can almost guarantee you 
Next weekends will be shorter. But for now, let's turn our attention to God in praise as we sing to him, as we pray together. So feel free to reshuffle um, at this point. But I'm going to pray for us and, and thank him for this good news. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you that in spite of our wayward walking, Christ walked down out of eternity, condescended, became humanity to live, die, and be raised on our behalf. He was perfectly humble, gentle, patient, forbearing with us in love all the way to the point of Calvary. And then he not only died for us, but he rose to victory. And so we confess it's he for me in life and eternity. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us enjoy him run to him for the forgiveness of our sin if we've yet to do that, receive his forgiveness, and then walk this walk together. Walk together as a church. Help us to do that to your glory so that the world would see and behold that this gospel's real. Jesus died to make us family. Let us live like family. So we ask that you would accomplish this and more than we could ask or imagine, all to the praise of your glory in and through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.